Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. We want to apologize first and foremost for our delay. We're going to blame technology today. <laughs> technology, but now we have sound, we have video, and now we can actually lead an effective Facebook Live, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, I think everyone's synced up on Facebook end, um, so everyone should be able to hear us now. Um, thanks so much for your patience in waiting for us to get here. Um, we'll hopefully make it worth your wait. <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> Um, and so we are here from Starkle Nutrition. Uh, that's whose Facebook page you're on. So hopefully you know that already. Um, we're a team of nine practitioners here. And we started these um, quite a while back, many weeks, uh, just to offer a service to the community and help us all feel a little more connected uh, while we've been stay at home now for the many, many weeks. I've lost count. Do you have any? I've lost count. <laughs> yeah. I, somewhere in mid-March, yeah. <laughs> whenever that was. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I actually see some welcoming comments from people. Yay. Wonderful. Uh, or Janae, I don't know. I'm going to do my best with that pronunciation from Malibu. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're in the Seattle area, so we're very jealous of your, your weather, perhaps. <laughs> I could, yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, today we're going to talk about brain health and cognitive health and all things that are covered under that giant umbrella. Um, I am Rihanna Giussi. I'm a functional nutritionist. Uh, certified through the state of Washington as a certified nutritionist. And um, I've been in the field for just over 15 years, have a huge passion for brain health, uh, just it's an extremely vulnerable population, also just an extremely rewarding population to work with. Um, since usually it's not just one individual you get to work with, but you get the entire family too. So it's just uh, starting a little revolution one family at a time, I like to think about it. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my co-host, Heather. Hello, hello, my name is Heather Brummer. I am also a certified nutritionist in the state of Washington. I am also a licensed acupuncturist in the state of Washington. And, uh, oh gosh, you know, my path to cognitive health is probably as unstraight as anything else, but um, I come to the field of nutrition through agriculture. I have a great passion for connecting people to nature. And um, I actually almost went into horticulture therapy. I don't know if I've ever really talked about that. So that was a different a different approach to the same concept. Oh, wow, so, we'll have yeah. to have a whole other Facebook live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. It's absolutely one of my favorite aspects of, of health and and particularly with nutrition because there's just so much you can do to impact this part of your health with what and how and why you put in your mouth <laughs> so, well, so well said um was there any one thing that really led you to cognitive health heather you know honest honestly i came to it through my interest and passion around diabetes and I know we're gonna we'll talk more about that, but um, it's it's on the path of health, you know, and it, and um, I've just I've just seen it have such a large impact in so many people's lives that it mm -hmm. it it continued to feed my passion around that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as as I think everyone's gonna hear today, um, the topic just encompasses so many key aspects of nutrition that it's um, we think of it as very an isolated field or a very specific uh, aspect of health and nutrition. But I think as everyone else see today, it's so connected in everything we do. Um, yeah, yeah. Which I think that's what really inspired me into this field. I, I think um, obviously our cognition and our brain health is such a huge part of our identity how we see ourselves, how we navigate through the world. So um, that's really just what what highlighted my initial passion with it. And also I have a huge passion for women's health. And so um, I came across a statistic uh, fairly recently, maybe in the last couple, five years or so, um, that two thirds um, of the individuals afflicted with some sort of cognitive decline, whether it be full blown Alzheimer's disease, um, are women. So um, that really inspired me to sort of dig a little bit deeper into this aspect as well, since this is sitting, uh, hitting um, the female community so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's a significant, that's a big number. <laughs> yeah. So I think we know yeah. that there's, there's a hormonal piece in there to say the least. So. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, um, so I guess first, maybe a great place to start is really just define um, what we mean when we when we say the field of um, of brain health and really sort of the spectrum of conditions and um, 
disease states that that includes. Um, so I don't know, would you like to start us off, Heather? <laughs> Maybe a few that might fall under that umbrella term of just um, cognitive health and brain health? Sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really broad, isn't it, to think about this. And it can encompass um, neurological conditions as well as, uh, you know, the, the, the spectrum, if you will, from something as uh, significant of a diagnosis as say Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or um, dementia or cognitive impairment, those are along the spectrum of eight, you know, we think of them as mostly age-related disorders, mm -hmm. um, but it, it can include traumatic, traumatic brain injury, excuse me, TBIs, it can include epilepsy and include something as, oh gosh, nebulous, if you will, as the concept of mood and mood disorders. But that's, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know of an age population that isn't impacted by that. Right, and, especially right now. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. My, yep. I have a lot of background working in depression and anxiety, both with nutrition and acupuncture. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot, the point of that is there's just so much that you can do with, with diet to support people through that. But um, you know, what's really the most, th th so with all of that, th those are sort of a really broad range of conditions that a person or people yeah, they might have. Them in terms of how are they all kind of, what connects them all in that sense. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And really what, one thing to think about that really connects these is inflammation yeah. and managing inflammatory processes, which is pretty broad, broad, isn't it, Rihanna? No, it is. And I mean, I think, um, you know, just in the last few webinars and trainings that we've all been to, um, you know, in the last five years, especially, you know, inflammation has really been highlighted as the root cause of so many disease states, whether it's cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, hyperlipidemia, um, yeah. all sorts of things, you know, really fall under that inflammation or inflammatory um, inflammatory uh, cascade, I suppose you could you could say. And so, um, you know, I think that maybe segues right into us talking about risk factors, since um, since all those conditions that I just mentioned, the diabetes, uh, the dyslipidemia or the hyperlipidemia, meaning elevated cholesterol, uh, mm -hmm. as well as cardiovascular disease. So whether that's active plaques forming in the arteries, uh, causing inflammation there, um, or or maybe you have an active clot, have had heart surgery, that sort of thing. Those, all of those three conditions especially put you at higher risk um, for impaired cognition in general. Yeah. And what's that, what's that saying, Rihanna? What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you're taking, if you're doing things to care for your heart health, mm -hmm. interestingly or coincidentally or not enough, <laughs> when you're caring for your heart and you're doing things to take care of those biomarkers, things like cholesterol and all of the components in the cholesterol panel, thinking about um, CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, mm -hmm. thinking about wow. blood pressure, which is a factor there. When you're managing those things that you know are going to help keep your heart healthy, you know, a side effect is they benefit the brain and cognitive health. There are a lot of the same things you would do for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for listing out some of those um, biomarkers to look at, because I mean, obviously, um, for individuals who are getting annual exams or currently working with their healthcare practitioner around these things, these are these are biomarkers you can continue to track just to make sure that things are either, you know, maintaining in that healthy range um, or tracking down if this is something you're actively working on. So mm -hmm. another biomarker would also be homocysteine that typically falls under under heart health and inflammation as well. Um, and more and more practitioners are measuring that, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, it's really nice to see that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, any other risk factors um, that might might fall into that cognitive decline? I know we're going to talk about diet today. We're going to um, talk about diet. Yes, we are. How that can sort of impact uh, your risk for for better or for worse. Well, I mean, of course, there's diet, there's genetics, which is a really exciting hot topic to mm -hmm. figure out. Um, you know, what role are genetics playing in our health? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a that's a really exciting emerging area of science, which can also make it feel a bit frustrating because there aren't a lot of hard conclusions yet. But there's some really interesting potential in understanding some of the markers that that are out there, right? Yeah. Um, 
you want to say more about that or that, that can? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's safe to say, you know, nowadays this is something that you may see tested more and more frequently now that I know there have been some changes with the FDA. It's more and more you're seeing it on more and more um, in home tests and things like that that are available to the public. Um, and I, I always just want to remind folks, genes are not your destiny. You know, we see plenty of individuals with, you know, the risk, the risk gene um, that don't get Alzheimer's and vice versa. Plenty of people without it that that may sometimes. So um, I would say it's not an information piece to necessarily be scared of, but, you know, another tool you can have in your pocket just to better understand your risk. And then you just know how to better focus your efforts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, as I understand it as well, there's an enormous power of choice yeah, in your health. So well said. So well said. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be another tool. It can be another piece of information. So it could be, sure. it could be very valuable to have that. Sure. Um, you know, we also know other, other risk factors include you know, some of the things we might we might take for granted. Smoking is actually a risk mm -hmm. factor we don't necessarily think of. Um, yeah, since we know nicotine is a neurotoxin. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... Or tobacco, rather, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> tobacco, yes, fair enough. Um, and it's not, you know, maybe different, not quite as common as it used to be, but that's also, mm -hmm. that depends on where you live. It can be very situational yeah. and and cultural. Yeah, and so. We know that even most many forms of pollution, so just constantly being around poor air quality, whether you're living in a really congested city, whether you're exposed to secondhand smoke, if it's not mm -hmm. you who are actively smoking, right. uh, or just, yeah, exposed, live in an area where maybe there's factories or just more pollution than, than, than normal. Um, Although I realize what is normal in today's day and age, um, there's there's, <laughs> there's uh, pollution everywhere right now. <laughs> All of us are exposed to some degree, but but really, you know, thinking about just some of those sources in terms when it comes to air quality, um, just making sure that you know you're keeping your home um, air quality as much as you can under your control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's again a huge, huge topic. But um, you know, broadly speaking, I think you did a great job covering the important pieces of that. Um, I would feel remiss if I didn't mention uh, a sedentary lifestyle is a huge risk factor for cognitive declines and neurological health. Just your whole nervous system benefits from exercise. This big thing up here on the top of our bodies <laughs> needs movement. It, they it need Our brain needs a moving body to function at its very best. Um, there's of volumes of research on the power of exercise for, for cognitive health and repairing cognitive health. Yeah, oh yes, that's what's really exciting too. I mean, we can even think just at lower level about um, mood and energy levels, you know, when we are not moving, not engaging with our environment in quite the same way um, and just moving in general, getting the circulation going just to help our body um, function properly. And I think all of us can speak to say that we've had times maybe where we haven't been as active and, and our mood really suffers because of that. Um, whether that's you right now, you know, experiencing that during during the global pandemic or under um, right. maybe a little less less active or it may just look very different than it had before. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we can. I I certainly can attest to to that personally and professionally, the impact of exercise on mood. Mm -hmm. And um, and also just, you know, exercise helps your brain grow. Mm -hmm. And as we think about some of the things, what can you do to support cognitive health? It's important to remember, like, it's a de absolutely beneficial for feeling better. And we can think of those endorphins that sort of give us that, you know, maybe a runner's high or a momentary or a more than a momentary feeling of feeling good and that's that's important and not to be discounted and and a powerful medicine really and other things happen in the brain when you exercise that make your neuro to use a catchphrase to make your neuroplasticity your ability to learn and grow stronger it's a very powerful medicine in that yeah. regard well and heather you know up until 10 years ago we didn't even think that was possible we thought right. you were born with a set amount of neurons. Uh, you you don't use them, you lose them. Um, yeah. They're this many. Yeah. They decline <laughs> as you, and that's it. Yeah, but Heather's exactly right. You know, um, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little more in terms of like how what's kind of making that um, happen. The the 
the neuroplasticity and the neurogenesis of building more neurons and really helping repair some of those connections. Um, how is that even possible? How does that work? <laughs> when you exercise, your, your brain secretes a, I guess it's a hormone. It's called brain-derived neurotropic factor. Mm -hmm. That's a hormone. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a peptide for sure. It's a protein <laughs> that um, it's, you know, in the, the, the really, I didn't catch, I didn't come up with this phrase myself at all, but you can think of it as miracle growth for the brain in terms of it, 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 it ignites neurons to grow mm -hmm. and, uh, and those connections between the neurons grow faster and get more interconnected. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the more of those that you have, the more uh, capacity a person has for cognitive cognition. I mean, that's really broad, but it's hard to say like, if you run, you will then be able to learn algebra, but you might actually be better able to learn algebra. <laughs> you may. Yeah, and some people, you know, based on their genetics and just their constitution are more, um, they produce more BDNF as compared to someone else. Um, and so, you know, some people are more likely to get an effect from that and a benefit from that than others. You know, we all will get some sort of benefit, but just some people's baseline and uh, peaks are, are unique in that, in that, uh, in that way. <laughs> yes. So it's, if you're, if anybody out there is, um, you know, still going to school, you're on going to school online and all of the ways that we're adapting, exercising before your tests will help. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It will clear your head, but it will, well, while you're studying too, it'll help. Yeah, oh, I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> last but not least, um, I think we want to add in hormonal health, which, um, you know, and, and typically we may only think of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, our sex hormones, but, you know, this includes all things like thyroid health, thyroid hormone. Um, this impacts also our neurotransmitters and things like that. This impacts our stress hormones like cortisol. Mm. Um, and it really affects how, you know, what types, what hormones, you know, get made, you know, in terms of like, if we're stressed, that can really impact that hormonal health piece. And therefore that also impacts cognition. So I think even everyday person might notice that their cognition is impacted when um, they're feeling more stressed and they're feeling just more frazzled. Um, that's likely due, you know, in part, you know, because, you know, they're producing a lot more of that stress hormone cortisol to help them have a stress response and meet that challenge. Um, and you know, that means that fewer resources are being diverted elsewhere to produce other types of hormones um, and just, you know, tend to other bodily functions. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And building on that, when there is a lot of stress over a period of time, chronic stress, mm -hmm. it can, you know, change how the brain takes in information and change how the brain does its job. So it can really, and it's not permanent, but, you know, you, a person, it can have an enormous impact. Uh, on your brain, and um, uh, uh, a colleague of mine coined the term uh, a rubber brain, where, <laughs> where you, you try to, you just can't get things to go in. You try and try and try and try to, to right learn, remember or to, right? And that's your mm -hmm. brain on long term cortisol. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not good. Good. Um, so we had a question from from the group asking what sort of signs and symptoms should we be looking out for um, in regards to cognition or brain health. You want to tackle that one, Heather? <laughs> I'm not, uh, I, I think I would need more information. What signs, what's, what's your take on that? What signs or symptoms would I like? So I think maybe sort of like how does that present um, in that sense? So this could be something as simple as um, everyday memory loss or um, yeah. you know, really, it, I mean, I think the classic example is starting, you know, just to forget where you put things, whether it's, you know, you can't find your keys and then progressing to maybe you can't ever remember where you parked your car in the parking lot and you have a harder and harder time finding that. And these moments happen to everyone, of course, you know, and, and it does not mean that you are going to get cognitive decline or that you are getting cognitive decline. Um, but it's really when those start to become more full blown and maybe you have a hard time recognizing faces and, um, and putting a name to that or remembering someone's name. And again, that can happen to the best of us in our flustered moments. Um, but yeah, just starting to look out for um, even just uh, changes in mobility and gait. So the ability, for instance, mm -hmm. to talk and walk at the same time, you know, that might be mm -hmm. something that really gets difficult um, mm -hmm. as as these types of disease states progress. Um, anything else you'd add there, Heather? I realize there's, there's a lot that can fall under this gamut too. Yeah, there is, there's a lot, there's a lot because, um, you know, just sort of when I was, I had my, I had my brain on sort of 
stress on the brain and what mm -hmm. um, what to kind of look for there. And it could be, I mean, I sort of listed a few things bef before I saw that question, um, mm -hmm. where you might have a hard time learning new things. Ah, yeah. You may feel challenged to remember the things that you knew, even, even you know, yeah. things that you feel are pretty usually right on the tip of your tongue. It can feel, um, you know, it could also feel like, um, now this is, you know, maybe you don't feel like, a, I want to say brain fog, which is a, a bit mm -hmm. of a, a term that can, that can be applied to a lot of different things going on in health, but just feeling fuzzy and not feeling clear in how you're thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And also um, just run down and fatigued and feeling tired easily, mentally feeling tired easily, not feeling rested after you sleep can even be part of it as well, where you just can't recoup you can't yeah. have that replenished yeah. feeling. Yeah, so Heather, you were touching on that short-term memory aspect. I mean, it's really hard just to learn new things and remember them, whether or not, you know, it's something you did earlier in the day um, or something that you did earlier last month, <laughs> you know, really getting those imprinted and transferred over into long-term memory. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very, very classic science. Um, we have another question actually asking about um, foods. Uh, that yeah. Are good Improvement. So that might that might uh, hurry us along to, uh, to the rest of our conversation. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a good transition because actually, what we wanted to talk Thank about next. Was food. Yeah. So I, I think we'll answer your question, and if not, please ask, and we'll we'll do our best to get an answer for you. Yeah. So I mean, um, today we're definitely going to talk about um, definitely some of the dietary options when it comes to brain health. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of different ways, you know, that you can really satisfy that. So depending on, you know, level of, um, of just how you want to go about it, you know, in that sense. Um, so what are what are some of your kind of go to, you know, dietary styles or dietary patterns for um, for treating cognitive health and just for whether it's for prevention or for full blown active disease state? Well, for, in my experience, those can be a bit different depending on where a person's coming in and what their primary concern is. You know, we, we talked a bit at first, risk factors being things like diabetes and heart health. Most commonly as a nutritionist, people are coming to see me, coming to see us. I think I can speak for both of us, but they're coming in for those most immediate concerns. And so, as we said before, if you're, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Mm -hmm. And and um, so as you're addressing some of those conditions, you're going to be supporting your 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 cognitive health. And so to get more specific, because that's kind of broad, thinking about eating in ways that help manage inflammation mm -hmm. is a really really powerful place to start. Mm -hmm. And when I when I say that, and I see you nodding your head, so I'll hand the, the hat over to you in a sec in a moment is um, there are many different ways of doing this in with a diet. And I know it's really exciting to have a new tool and a new dietary approach and, and, they'll, and it's really useful and powerful information. Sometimes we wanna do a more mm, specific approach. kind of a, <laughs> an approach for something, but um, there's an enormous amount you can get done eating in a way that manages inflammation. And I, I bet you'd love to speak to that. <laughs> yeah, so I think a lot a lot of different eating styles fall under that. I mean, the one that really comes to mind first, I bet for both of our listeners too, is just the Mediterranean plan, you know, mm -hmm. something that's really, really rich in anti-inflammatory fats. So a lot of omega-3s and unsaturated fats uh, would fall into that. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, that moderate amount of protein um, and close to, you know, between 25 and 30, 30 to 35% coming from fat, you know. Um, so that's it's really not a low fat diet. People no. are surprised when I say that, you know, because we yeah. have it kind of ingrained in some capacity that a low fat diet is the healthiest, mm -hmm. particularly for heart health. And this is saying, you know, this has been shown to be beneficial for heart health as well as managing overall inflammation. And it's not a low fat diet. Yeah, it's not. But I think um, something how it really differs from other higher fat eating styles is really focusing on that quality yes. of fat. Um, so, you know, obviously trying to, to, to get organic when you can, you know, when that's when that's available to you. Um, and, you know, maybe that's buying the, the fats in um, glass packaging, for example, as opposed mm. to plastic. So just making sure that the quality of those fats um, is not... Um, you know, being exposed to any microplastics and just toxins that may leak out of the plastic. So mm -hmm. 
always, always quality. And uh, just trying to focus on, again, those more unsaturated fats rather than those that are more saturated. You need a balance of both. But again, the main, main uh, proponent of those is going to be more of the anti-inflammatory fats, which are going to be more of those unsaturated omega-3s coming from, from, and so I bet people want to know where those sorts of things come from. Um, but before we get there, I mean, yeah. are there any dietary styles um, that really would fall under that um, anti-inflammatory umbrella that we might use with patients? Uh, say that again, sorry. Are there any dietary? Are there other anti-inflammatory diet, diet styles that we might also recommend? Oh, well, um, you know, there are, uh, it depends on the body. Some bodies do quite well with more of a paleo type of a dietary approach where they're really minimizing, minimizing certain food groups that, that in some bodies can be inflammatory. In some cases, it can be grains and dairy. Um, in other situations, uh, diets that are vegan or vegetarian can be quite mm -hmm. supportive of lowering inflammation. Um, I have I can I have seen that that that's not always the case for everybody. That mm -hmm. uh, I've had folks say, "Hey, I'm going to eat no, you know, completely vegan because I've heard that's the best anti-inflammatory diet." And after looking at blood work, looking at markers of cholesterol, looking at markers of other markers of inflammation, looking at markers of glycemic health. I don't think I mentioned that in great detail. Uh, in the glycemic health is thinking about managing blood sugars and uh, insulin and, and making sure that the body isn't met. It's really, it's a measure of how well is the body fueling itself and how much work is the body having to do in order to do that. And, you know, not everybody responds in the same way to a vegan diet versus something um, you know, p potentially very high in animal products. Although overall, a, um, a diet really, really high in just animal products is probably going to end up being about as hard on a body as a diet without any animal products, right? I think on those extremes, right. they can tend to be a bit more challenging. Yeah, yeah well said. Well, and there's so many different ways to follow plant-based diet, right? You, know, you can do that yes. really healthily by eating, you know, yes crackers and, and I, <laughs> I had a teacher in school who was yeah. so I think that's that's where it always right. comes in you know when you're trying yeah. anything new making sure yeah come you know get it get a practitioner on board and um, have someone to support you in that health journey that way um, you can get support in terms of troubleshooting and just getting creative with that um, mm -hmm. and making sure that you kind of you're following it um in a way that's still benefiting you know your goals and of course bottom line helping to manage whatever inflammation is going on in the body Right, right. So there are ways, just to, to mention it, there are absolutely ways of eating in a keto profile mm -hmm. where, you know, conventionally that's been a bit higher in the animal products, mm -hmm. um, animal foods, which can manage some aspects of inflammation. But there's also ways of doing it where you're actually bringing in an enormous amount of plant material. Oh, and, I th you know, I've seen that be a really... Um, we haven't even touched on gut health, and I don't, know, I don't know that we'll get into that in an enormous amount of detail because the connection between your digestive system and cognitive function is probably a whole volume mm -hmm. all by itself. But uh, in a word, it's really important to con include fiber in the diet on a regular basis for good systemic health. And I think for the sake of time, I would probably leave it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm so much glad you mentioned um, the keto. I think you and I have really uh, are have come to know and love the term ketotarian. You know, yes. that's, that's not you know having lots of butter and bacon um, at all, but really having again lots of nuts and seeds and fish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and um, just having a much more uh, cruciferous vegetables and vegetables in general, um, as Heather mentioned, getting that really important fiber piece just to, again, support detoxification in the body um, and support every system under the sun. It cannot be emphasized enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and just because we're here and I know we're going to we're going to move on and get into some other details, but I, I would feel remiss if we didn't mention intermittent fasting as a dietary approach. Mm -hmm. There's 
you're really interesting research. The National Institute of Health on, on aging is doing a really good and interesting research on the impact of intermittent fasting on cognitive health. Wow. And intermittent fasting is a really broad term. Do you want to speak to that? I don't yeah, that. so, you know, there's a couple of different ways they're studying that, you know, whether it's due to the caloric restriction aspect that, that naturally happens during these intermittent fasting protocols. So as Heather mentioned, you know, that would be meaning you're taking, you're having less intake uh, during certain periods um, and maybe normal intake during other periods. So it could look like something like a, as simple as a prolonged nightly fast uh, that we natu most of us naturally do, meaning we aren't eating after dinner. Um, and then we, we, we have at least 12, eight to 12 hours really until our, our morning meal um, to break that fast. Um, so essentially, you're, you're not, you're limiting the amount of calories you're having, obviously, overnight, because you're sleeping, hopefully, during those hours. And also, you know, during that time, um, we can have some beneficial effects on blood sugar regulation. We can also um, allow the, the brain to do its job, especially when there's ample time between dinner and bedtime. Um, that way, the bulk of your sleep is not spent digesting your dinner meal, but really able to focus on other tasks. For instance, one of those, um, one of those theories is really that it's cleaning up the brain. So it's a term called mm -hmm. autophagy and really helping to stimulate that. We can think of it as a giant squeak sweeper that can really come in and help clean up, degunk all the neural connections, take out the trash yes. the <laughs> and get everything ready for the next day. So um, I think that that touches again on the importance of sleep when it, when it comes to brain health. Um, but obviously, you know, again, if the brain is focused on managing blood sugar, digesting foods, um, it can effectively spend its energy uh, doing the cleanup that's really necessary in the brain. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of where the fasting element comes in too, because again, if the body isn't having to, again, manage blood sugars, be digesting food, um, it can much easier attend to other cellular needs and repair. Absolutely. And just, just a caveat out there for folks, if you've tried intermittent fasting and you found like mm -hmm. it just didn't seem to fit you very well. Um, sometimes that it, it doesn't mean everybody needs to do intermittent fasting, but sometimes it can be uh, more challenging in a body that has a lot of stress and getting some other components of stress managed a bit better in the body first mm -hmm. might then better tolerate intermittent fasting. So if you've tried it and it didn't quite work, it may not be for you and that's fine. And it might be if there was a, if it was at a time when you had a lot of stress or there were some other things kind of going on physiologically or otherwise, mm -hmm. you, could, you could give it a try again. Yeah, such a great caveat. I think um, many people out there can be, when trying new things, you know, it's so easy for us to write them off without giving them <laughs> proper time or, or even just troubleshooting different ways we can approach those things. Absolutely. So, <laughs> things to think about. Um, so I, mean, I guess when we step back and we think about the goals of all these different eating styles, um, mm -hmm. we think about Mediterranean, when we think about paleo, um, when we think about keto or inter intermittent fasting or vegan and vegetarian, they seem all over the board, right? But I think if we really step back and think about what are the goals of all of these diets and protocols, um, number one, we're trying to improve um, insulin resistance. We're trying to correct any um, balances that are happening in the lipids and the cholesterol profile. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also trying to, again, promote autophagy. Um, and so, again, it's that cleanup mechanism in the brain. Uh, That's the garbage truck. We're trying to help the garbage trucks. <laughs> trying to help the garbage truck. Yeah. That ties into Heather's comment on fiber really nicely because, yeah. again, you can't take out the trash without fiber's help. And, um, and really just supplying your body with a wealth of antioxidants where, again, that, that wealth of plant products comes in that Heather touched on in the anti-inflammatory diet. And even in the styles of keto that we might might use for the red individual, they're still going to be full and full of antioxidants um, and compounds from plants that are helping to reduce oxidative stress in the body. Um, Preach it. And, and, <laughs> yes. And, and so your body can effectively detoxify, you know, without the proper inputs. And that's where, again, lots of fruits and vegetables come in to help and support your body in that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. They are the, they're the, they're the cleaning agents, right? Yeah. Like if, yeah. if the fiber is the garbage truck, taking it out in the body, antioxidants mm -hmm. and, vi and vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. they are the scrub brush. They are the the tools that the body uses to mechanically, uh, you know, clean the corners of all the cells. <laughs> That's very yeah. technical. It's a very technical <laughs> term. <laughs> I love it. We need to conceptualize, right? Um, 
So I don't know if now would be a good time to really talk about some specific, you know, nutrients um, or really just jumping to foods, you know, at this time in the conversation. Um, yeah. What are your, should we, should we kind of quickly go over some nutrients and then focus more of our attention on the fun part? food? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it's worth a mention, but yeah, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would, I would think people probably want to know like, what are the foods <laughs> or what does it yeah. look like? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I guess what are some of the key nutrients and foods that are involved in brain health? Like what are kind of your go-tos when trying to either assess someone's diet or um, even maybe looking at a blood panel you know, in terms of what, what we're looking for in terms of what we want to emphasize to help correct everything we've been talking about? Yeah, fair enough. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if I'm looking at blood work, you know, I'm going to look at things like um, glycemic index. So looking at blood sugars, uh, both a snapshot, which is your fasting blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month view. I'd look at uh, cholesterol in its various um, forms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to think about eating regularly. We're oh, sorry, we're not thinking about food yet. Sorry, we're thinking about nutrients. Sorry. Um, so then I'm, but also, so in addition, right, so thinking about fiber, so that's kind of where I went with that, is thinking about fiber, because that has a very immediate palpable impact on cholesterol, as well as managing blood sugars. Um, Omega-3 fats, incredibly important for, we're thinking specifically here for cognitive function, because it is a component, you're, it's such a large component of your brain tissue are omega-3 fats as actually as well as some saturated fat. Yeah. I mean, that's something we look at really closely here at Starkle, you know, mm -hmm. doing a quick omega check through the NutraVal or something like that, that we can run um, and easily just kind of get a capture and a snapshot of, you know, the health of someone's omega-3. So whether that's looking at the balance between omega-6s and omega-3s, mm -hmm. uh, looking at some of those individual levels, because um, that's really your cellular health, right? That's these yeah. are the factors the building blocks that make up the, the cellular membranes, um, helping to determine what gets in and out of the cell. And then also mm -hmm. that nerve, um, neuron or neural con conductivity. So really protecting those neurons, um, you know, and insulating them just to make sure that everything's moving quickly and efficiently in the brain. So when we think about the importance of fats, our brain is, the majority of it is fats. It is. It is. And, um, you know, along those same lines and thinking about how the nerves connect uh, and, and, and also I, before I say this, you know, the next thing is to think as well that fats are important for, for protecting those nerve cells so that they can do their job properly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so because because what I was going to say next actually was also thinking about the nutrients that help those very active cells do their jobs. And those are B vitamins, mm, yes. bro broadly yes. speaking, yes. really important for neural health, for for your nervous system. That's what we're thinking about here. Right. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So that might be, um, you know, looking at B12 status, so, looking at. Um, go ahead. Methyl uh, MM, MMA. We did we see that too. Um, methyl oh. melanic status. So mm -hmm. that could be again an inverse way of kind of indirect way looking at B12. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this is definitely one of the most common things we may supplement for individuals that may be deficient in this way and need a little bit more help um, in case they can't really bridge that gap through diet, especially. Yes. Yeah, I find. Um not to get too far, you know, not to talk too much about supplements right now, but that's absolutely one of the most valuable supplements is keeping, yeah. keeping B vitamins up. Mm -hmm. It yeah. depends on what else is going on. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry, just and we're to answer, right, Heather? You know, someone can ask us a very, what they think is a very straightforward question and most commonly it depends. <laughs> I know it. I know. I don't know why they put up with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think again, to highlight just the personalization, the individualization when we're, when we're working with these individuals, it's really yeah. not just treating every patient the same that comes in with, mm -hmm. you know, even the same type of cognitive decline, because we really want to target what are the factors for that person? Where are their deficiencies? What else do they have going on that needs to, um, needs to be corrected? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there are no across the board, straightforward answers, right? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, and the B vitamins are important for homo thinking about homocysteine. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be involved in managing that cycle too, to keep, mm -hmm. keep homocysteine in proper levels for sure. Yeah. Um, and so I know we touched on the fact that, you know, men seem to be 
uh, affected by this by this more than than sorry women seem to be affected by this more than males. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, the research actually supports that the nutritional component is, is even more important for women, um, such that, you know, they, they seem, women seem to be more affected uh, by this and where that nutritional quality piece comes in is just really ensuring that um, it's, it's especially there for women. Obviously, it's important for both genders, um, but even more important um, is, is it for women. So um, that really means thinking about, obviously, Heather already mentioned the fiber, um, but really focusing on proper intakes of vitamin C, beta carotene in our orange and red fruits and vegetables, um, and also uh, getting proper amounts of vitamin E. So that's going to be from our, again, our, that's usually found in fats. So um, coming from nuts, seeds. Nuts. Yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah. 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 It's really worth emphasizing that, that diet for women's health, particularly when we're thinking about cognitive health, mm -hmm. is, is particularly important. It's important for, for both genders, but particularly women really need to focus on, uh, can have a, I should say it this way, it can have a diet, can have sig a really significant impact in women's health, yeah. in women's yeah. cognitive health. Well said, well said. Yeah. It's worth yeah. emphasizing. There's a lot of this. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I can't say it enough. Um, <laughs> And so with all that talk of kind of nutrients and building blocks, I mean, I wonder if it's a good time to talk, switch over to even some specific foods, like um, what yeah. are your, some, some of your favorite foods to support brain health? Well, you know, I, there's, I, of course, you know, I mentioned omega-3 fats, right? And, and we're, when I mention omega-3 fats, I have most people say, oh, yeah, yeah, salmon is great. I, I really like salmon. It's, you know, I eat it when I can. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, absolutely, that's a great example. It's a great, it's a great source of omega-3 fats, and it's a great example um, of, of how you can get that nutrient from food. And I and there are many sources, there are many food sources, and there's good sources from fish, there's good sources from plants, but um, when we think about fish, uh, it's there's a whole array of other choices out there, things like sardines, things like mackerel, anchovies, herring, those little smelly fish. <laughs> Description. So, uh, so the same Heather that everyone should just open up a can of sardines. <laughs> just belly up, just belly up. A can of sardines with a fork and just no, no. Well, you can, you could try it. I actually have plenty of people who uh, who are delightfully surprised that they really enjoy that. And um, it's also worth mentioning that Caesar salad dressing has anchovies mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. and you don't. Really. We don't really remember that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and that said, I, I can't say that I would think of Caesar salad dressing as a significant source of omega-3s, <laughs> but the point of that was to think that a little can go a long way and a little bit can make a difference. And adding something like sardines into other cooking can be a very easy way to incorporate some of these foods that, you know, we might intellectually get it that they're good for us and mm -hmm. and our palates might take a little longer to go along for that ride mm -hmm. and so you can do things like take a take one or two sardines mix it into a meatloaf mix mm -hmm. it into a pasta sauce something that already has a really strong flavor and it will just um it will just help enhance the flavor without necessarily overrunning what it is you're making yeah provide that nice salty component yeah mm -hmm. Um, another source of omega-3s, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the seed sources are things like ground flax, hemp seeds, and chia seeds. And you can sprinkle those on your tin of sardines. I'm kidding. You can sprinkle those on anything to get a You're little bit of fiber too, Heather. Yes, to get a little bit of fiber. Um, you can sprinkle them on your salad. You can sprinkle them on greens if you've cooked some broccoli to have with your, you know, whatever else you're eating. Just a teaspoon here, a teaspoon there. They, it adds up and it, it can really, um, in little ways that I think are easy to take in terms of flavor, mm -hmm. they can make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're over our, um, 
over our one thirty kind of cutoff, but I know Heather and I got started about 15 minutes late. So, yeah. so, so we're taking the time. <laughs> uh, we get to, we get to talk for closer to that 50 minutes or so. Um, so I know, I know one of my favorite ways um, yeah, yeah. To, to enjoy foods for brain health is um, our local co-op up here in the greater Seattle area, uh, PCC. They have a great recipe that I've, I've been making at home myself for years now. Um, is their roasted cauliflower and tahini sauce. So um, you get a lot of bang for your buck with this one. Not only is it delicious, but um, so you have the roasted cauliflower, obviously is the, the bulk of that dish. Um, and so that's being in the cruciferous family, that's really, really important just in terms of um, supporting your body with detox, uh, proper detoxification um, and just helping to reduce oxidative stress um, mm -hmm. promote that healthy cell turnover um, in, your, in, in your system. Um, and then also, you know, you have um, usually onions and carrots in there as well. So the allium family, so those onions, uh, leeks, garlic, those all fall in that family. Um, more supportive foods, again, for helping with detoxification. They also support, you know, fi uh, fiber intake and things like that, too. Um, you know, you have the carrot supplying beta carotene, which I called out as a key nutrient, really important for women. Um, and then they're also in this delicious tahini sauce. So um, tahini would be, it, it's a form of sesame paste. So great source of vitamin E, great source of anti-inflammatory fatty acids, and it's just delicious. <laughs> and what are we going to sprinkle on top? <laughs> Probably some, some chia. <laughs> Exactly. It's that <laughs> easy. <laughs> Parsley in there too is always a winner. Um, since again, just getting getting really high nutrient quality there using those fresh herbs, which can't be emphasized enough either. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so I wonder real quickly now of kind of just yeah. summarizing and kind of going over some of those lifestyle um components that are impacted. Um so yeah, I know I have a I have a fun acronym that I like to use of kind of just keeping it all. I'll let. Um, I was going to say, say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it. It's great. Shield your brain. Um, is it, We can all remember that. Shield your brain. Um, that's definitely one of the easiest ways. Um, and we'll go through what each letter sort of stands for. So the, um, the S stands for developing good sleep habits. Mm. Uh, we already touched on that in terms of when, when we're sleeping, that's when our bodies clean up mechanism. Again, that garbage truck, the garbage uh garbage truck driver comes in and helps do it <laughs> <laughs> with stand for uh, getting a handle on stress so handling mm -hmm. stress well um, mm -hmm. as we already mentioned when our body's under high levels of stress um, more resources are being uh, diverted towards producing cortisol that stress hormone to again help us meet that stressor which means that um resources are, aren't going elsewhere. You know, they're not going to fuel our brain. They're not going to provide other hormones that we need for proper functioning and proper brain function. Um, stress is a huge one for sure. Mm, yeah, we could, we could go on and on about that, but well done. You did a good. <laughs> um, one we actually haven't touched too much on and is especially key right now, I, you know, interaction mm. with friends would be what the I stands for. So I, I realize this is um, something that can be difficult right now while we're still social distancing. Um, but even, you know, you and I, Heather, we're getting some good interaction points right now, even though we're not in the same city. <laughs> that is true. That is true. We're all grateful for, for this. So, uh, yeah, when uh, there's research out there when really looking at certain parts of the world that seem to have lower incidence of cognitive decline, um, you know, what really tends to be a hallmark is that um, people are really engaged in their community and really have a lot of in social interaction. Um, and this is something that our culture, you know, we tend to as we tend to put our elderly in homes, you know, when they when they get when their needs become higher. Um, but in other cultures, you know, the elderly and, and um, older individuals stay with the family for a long mm -hmm. time. And in these areas of the world where they have less incidence of um, cognitive decline, we tend to see the elderly still playing very active roles. So they're still maybe working part time or doing something they love. You know, they're still biking. Um, they're still going for walks with their friends. They're still really playing an, an active, engaged um role in the community, you know, giving them a sense of purpose, helping with that drive. So we know that this plays in to um, protecting your brain as well. So I just, I know we're getting a little short on time, but just because we're right here, it's, you know, 
we're in a really strange time in our strange culture where we're in our culture is quite spread out and very often we don't necessarily live where we grew up or we might move multiple times in our life and we make really meaningful connections at different times in our lives and then life will take us maybe to a different geographic region and now you know to varying degrees we're unable to connect in the ways we're used to connecting in that are really important for our well-being for connecting and so you know it's uh, people are taking and making a great effort to stay connected through their phone and through the internet and all of the different capacities and i just would make a plug if you will for for physically connecting and we can't physically connect so much right now and what i mean really is what about writing letters right like there's just nothing more heartwarming than getting a handwritten note and who has the time i know <laughs> but a quick i love you written on a piece of paper and you know just put it in an envelope and send it to somebody, you will feel connected to that person in a very different way. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, Heather. I love that idea. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea. Um, would you like to talk about the E? In exercise, exercise, yeah. exercise, exercise, <laughs> exercise. Ah, move, 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 move. <laughs> oh, should I say more? Um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of our talk together how important moving is. Our brain needs to be in a moving body. And increasingly in our culture, we just don't do that. And increasingly these past several months, we haven't been able to do that in a way that we're really used to. And, and it feels like another stress even to figure out how to keep moving our bodies because we can't don't have the same access to the usual ways of moving our body. Like many of us aren't even doing the commute in the way we're used to. And even though that doesn't feel like exercise in any conventional sense, all of that movement adds up. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're getting far enough along in this process of, of uh, you know, staying home that people are really starting to feel a difference. Mm -hmm not only in their ability to think, but also in how they feel, in their ability to sleep. And it's just even these little movements that we do. So if it's as simple as, you know, setting a little timer on your on your, on your phone or on your computer in some capacity to prompt you every hour to get up for two minutes and march in place, you will get 300 steps if you do that. <laughs> have you counted, Heather? <laughs> yes, actually I have. <laughs> Yeah. There. <laughs> wow, 300 steps just in that two minutes of marching. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. And over time, yeah. if you if you were to do that for your work hour, that's three times eight hours in your in your work day. Um, yeah, I can't do that math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the recommendation around 10,000 steps. There's there's a lot of research around that. It mm -hmm. adds up to about five miles a day, mm -hmm. and that can feel like an intimidating number. So if you break it down, two minutes every hour. If you break it down over your lunch break, take 10 minutes. Before your work day, take 10 minutes. After your work day, take 10 minutes. You know, those pieces, those pieces add up. Oh. They add up. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I'm just agreeing with you. But yeah, we don't need to make this complicated. Yes. You know, all the research being done highlights, um, you know, higher intensity activities as being associated with higher levels of BDNF. But re the reality is any movement you do, whether it's a 10 minute walk around the block or, you know, a 10 minute higher intensity interval training that you might do um, with your trainer or something like that, you're both you're both getting benefit. I can't emphasize that enough. It's true. It's true. And I, I know I, I now I keep coming back to that. Well, I, the 10,000 steps a day, you know, there's a there's actually a lot of research behind that number and that that is equivalent to about 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And that doesn't even have to be in a 30 minute chunk of time. Yeah, you could break you that can, up as you mentioned. You can break that up into 10 minutes and still experience a physiologic benefit. Mm -hmm. And you know, these days, let's take what we can get. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not all of us are in a place, you know, since, you know, this uh, yeah. 
cognition often depends older individuals. These are individuals, you know, that I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend start doing a higher intensity exercise routine. It's just because their risk of injury is much higher and other individuals may be at higher risk of injury as well. And then you're just causing more inflammation. So that kind of is counterintuitive and not productive to our goals, right? So it, it's again, true. putting the right, the right approach to the right person. Absolutely. And finally, just to, to you know, hopefully not belabor this too much. It's really important for other aspects of cognitive health. Let's broadly call it stress management to take action where you can. So if you feel like I'm not going to have brain benefit unless I do 30 minute sprints or whatever, right? Like it's got to be this certain way or it doesn't work. It's not, it's not actually the case. And it's, and um, any time you can take action, you're benefiting your health. It's a good habit to start to build, to say, because how many times have we said, well, I can't get the 30 minute workout in, so I guess I just won't do anything. Well, good grief, what about 15 minutes? That counts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, readjust that dial. Where along the dial can you kind of meet yourself at? Yeah. Two minutes that day, that's okay. Because consistency is really important. And if you're starting this at 80 years old or you're starting this at 30 years old, you're building the habits of being consistently active. And what what we see in other cultures isn't necessarily that people started at the age of 70 to be really active and get engaged with their friends. I mean, maybe they've taken on new challenges. But in many cultures where, as as you mentioned earlier, Rihanna, that we're seeing, you know, very, very different outcomes in cognitive health in some certain, po you know, different populations around the world. They've been active their whole lives. They've been connected their whole lives. And that, you know, um, maybe we have that, maybe we don't, but we can always start today with what we've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so well said, Heather. Um, that, I mean, I think that segues really nice into the L and shield your brain. You know, this would be learning new skills. Um, and again, I think most people immediately think Sudoku and crossword puzzles. And those are great, especially if you enjoy them. Um, but again, once you sort of do it a couple times and you understand how crossword puzzles work, um, you're not getting as much benefit anymore, it actually turns out. So um, again, not necessarily a reason to not do them, especially if you enjoy them. Um, but really, when it comes to learning a new skill, this could be something as as large as learning a new language or learning how to play a new instrument. Um, but again, to start really small in that five minute action sort of space, um, it could just be learning how learning a new route home from work. If you're someone who's actively commuting to work right now, uh, trying a different route, kind of getting yourself out of autopilot and training yourself to learn a new way to get home. Um, another way would be to use your non dominant hand you know, for things around the house, whether that's eating, you know, with, with chopsticks yeah. with our non-dominated hand, which is yeah. really hard. I've, I've tried occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like not a fair fight. <laughs> um, or even maybe brushing, you know, my teeth with my, my non-dominant hand. Um, Cause again, it's, it's really just helping to build new neural pathways. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's my favorite challenge for folks mm -hmm. when they're feeling really frustrated that they're not able to incorporate, you know, whatever new thing in their lives that they're trying mm -hmm. to incorporate. Try brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand for three days and see how quickly you come up with excuses to not do it. <laughs> Something so small. <laughs> Ch changes, changes uncomfortable. And we just actually have to find a way to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can have a whole, whole talk on that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. And did you have a, a, Last but not least, the D. Yeah. <laughs> Dietary, which I think we already covered. So that would just be eating a healthy yeah. diet, like we already discussed. High in anti-inflammatory fats, yeah. high in fiber, high in lots of color to really provide lots of antioxidants and help manage uh, oxidative stress in the body. Right. So if nothing else, mm -hmm. you know, you can you you know, there's some there's absolutely more sophistication in terms of diet for particular outcomes. But, you know, broadly speaking, if you can really have your diet support managing inflammation, I was trying to not say it with too many negatives, you know, <laughs> to help manage inflammation, you're doing yourself a huge benefit for cognitive health. I think that's a great place to pause. Um, if there are any questions, we've been talking now for right about 50, 55, 58 minutes now. Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has any additional questions, uh, thoughts, concerns. 
Um, while we're waiting for people to comment, I'll just mention that, um, again, we're with Starkle Nutrition. Mm -hmm. Our office is located in the U District. Um, we are currently 100% telehealth right now. Um, mm -hmm. You can have your appointment in your pajamas, no judgment, mm -hmm. um, for the safety of your own home. Best commute ever. Yeah, best <laughs> commute ever. <laughs> um, and again, as I mentioned, when we started, there's nine of us here. So um, you would just go to starklenutrition.com. Um, you can read about each of us practitioners. Both Heather mm -hmm. and I are listed there in the About Us. Uh, and there's a long list of very talented individuals mm -hmm. that bring forth their heart and soul to help help you with what's what you what you'd like support with. Mm -hmm. I'm really impressed with our team. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, and you can always uh, fill out the contact us form if you're interested in learning more or um, schedule an appointment with any of us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I see um, Susan enjoyed our time together and thank you. We really appreciate having you here. And, um, you know, as, as you know, this will be on our Facebook um, page and you can revisit it as, as much or as often as you like. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, <laughs> going once you know what if you think of something five minutes after we close it down post it post it and we'll answer for you if you've got a question no pressure <laughs> and i'm happy to post a link to the recipe i talked about and if heather if you have any favorite recipes you'd like to post that incorporate um any of the smaller fish like the anchovy sardines you mentioned um we'll yeah. go ahead and post uh, an option there for you as well just to help you dip your toe in the in the water <laughs> <laughs> this this smelly fish water <laughs> No, they're wonderful. They're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.